Good morning. I'm glad you're able to take a moment to uh, join together for worship. There are no announcements for today. We'll just dive right in with the reading. We're reading out of uh, Ezra 6. Then, according to the word sent by King Darius, Tetanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, Shethar Boznai and their associates did with all diligence what King Darius had ordered. So the elders of the Jews built and prospered through the pro prophesying of the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, son of Edo. They finished their building by command of the God of Israel and by decree of Cyrus, Darius, and King Artaxerxes of Persia. And this house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. The people of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the returned exiles celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. They offered at the dedication of this house of God 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and as a sin offering for all of Israel, 12 male goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. Then they set the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their courses for the service of God at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. On the 14th day of the first month, the returned exiles kept the Passover, for both the priests and the Levites had purified themselves, all of them were clean. So they killed the Passover lamb for all the returned exiles, for their fellow priests and for themselves. It was eaten by the people of Israel who had returned from exile, and also by all who had joined them and separated themselves from the pollutions of the nations of the land to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. With joy, they celebrated the festival of unleavened bread seven days, for the Lord had made them joyful and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them, so that he aided them in the work on the house of God, the God of Israel. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. We wrap up the story of the rebuilding of the temple today. We have been telling this story over the last month and change, a story that began with the exiled Jewish people returning to the promised land after 70 years away. And over this time that we've followed them, they have grappled with both internal and external challenges to the rebuilding of the temple. Externally, they've had to grapple with the, the other communities and nationalities around them playing sort of political sabotage and, and having to work through that. And then internally, they have had their own challenges. They, once they had permission to get going again, they, their get up and go was kind of lacking and they had uh, the, prophets, uh, the prophets Haggai and Zechariah to prod them back into action and to keep them moving. And so now, after five years of work, they have finished the temple and they celebrate the Passover once more. If you look at the story of the Jewish people in the Old Testament, it is an interesting thing that the Passover is celebrated yearly. But you look at when we hear of the, we actually, the Bible tells us about the Passover being celebrated. It, it happens rather rarely, and it always happens at a moment of, of a, a national importance, a, a moment, a sort of a turning point. All right, so you go back to the first Passover. The first Passover happens when the, the Hebrew people are slaves, and they pack, and they get to have this, this meal in faith that the next day they're going to leave, that, that they had gone to bed as slaves and tomorrow they're going to get up as a free people. And so that, that's the first Passover, this mo moment of importance. Right? The next time we read of the Passover, they're about to enter the promised land under the, uh, the leadership of, of Joshua after 40 years in the wilderness. And then we don't hear of the Passover being celebrated again for centuries until we hear of it under the uh, reign of King Hezekiah when he's leading a major revival uh, of leading the people uh, back towards faithfulness and away from idolatry. And then a century later after that, King Josiah does something similar. He... Uh, 
Josiah is leading the nation when they had lost the Bible and they, they find it and they read it together and they realize what they are called to, to do and to be and they celebrate the Passover as a way to recommit themselves to being God's people worshiping in God's temple in, in Jerusalem. And so those are the moments when we read of the Passover being celebrated in the Old Testament before this moment in Ezra. Like it had been celebrated yearly, but, but it, it's remembering these are the, the big ones. These are the big Passovers that, that a major moment has occurred. The people were freed or they entered the promised land or the whole nation turns away from idolatry. And here it is, like they, they are turning towards uh, worshiping God in the temple again. And so that marks it as a pretty big deal. This, this is a high point. Another way that this moment becomes uh, marked as important is they trot out the title, right? They, they have a title for themselves. They, they, the, the full title of who they are is they are the sons of Israel, right? That's the fullness of who they understand themselves to be. And they don't, that, that is not a title that is used often. It is only used uh, two times in, in Ezra. The first time it's when they start rebuilding the temple. Uh, and and this, the second time is now when they finish the temple and they start uh, having the, the Passover meal. Like the, they don't call themselves by that full title, the, the sons of Israel uh, otherwise, because that's, well, it's not how we, we usually talk, right? If you, if you think about it, like I, some of us have formal titles and they don't get used very often. I have a formal title, my, my formal title is uh, not pastor. The fullness of the title is, I am an elder in full connection in the Missouri Conference of the United Methodist Church. And no one ever refers to me as that, right? The only time, I, I, people just call me Andy, but the only times I hear that full title, I've only heard it a few times in my life, an elder in full connection in the United, in Missouri Conference of the United Methodist Church. I hear that title when I was ordained. I was called, I'm, I've been called by that title when I was sent to my first appointment, and, and then when I was sent to my second appointment, and then when I, I was sent here to Shelbina and Honeywell. So I've only been called by that four times in my life. And, and that kind of gets at it, right? You, you use the most formal title at that moment of, of major life life-changing significance. And, and that's what's happened here. They are calling themselves, we are the, the sons of Israel. They have started worshiping at the temple uh, that they have finally rebuilt. They are, are going to celebrate the Passover once more. And this is the moment that marks them. They are living back into being the sons of Israel, or as we would probably say today, the, the children of Israel. They are understanding themselves once more to be following in the footsteps of their patriarch, Jacob, who in his struggles with God, God got to be renamed struggles with God. That's his name. And, and struggles with God is Israel. That's what the word means, struggles with God. And so they are once again recommitting themselves to be this people, the sons of Israel, the descendants of the people who have struggled with God in the past. And now they're recommitting themselves that they're going to get back on this path. And we're going to continue to be the people who walk with and struggle with how do we follow God. And, and, and so this is this, this moment when they're doing this, and, and this last detail I think is worth noting about it, that uh, as they, they worship once more at the temple, as they celebrate the Passover, as they organize themselves into Levites and priests and have their schedule of worship, they also make a point to say, this is the moment at which they invite everyone home, right? This is the point at which they invite everyone in the surrounding area who wants to separate themselves out from how far they had strayed, and, and it becomes a homecoming of sorts. Right? This is when everyone can come home who has stra their family has strayed away while most of the Jewish people had gone into exile. If anyone had stayed behind, now, now you can come home too. If this event was happening today, at this moment, as the Passover was being celebrated, as, as the temple was finished, this is when you'd expect the fireworks to go off and the band to play. Or if it was a movie, we would expect the credits to roll. Like this is the high point of, of, what, of the book of Ezra. 
However, this is neither an event today, nor is it a movie. What it is, is a story that we read, the story of God's people, and here we are as the, reading it as the word of God for us, the people of God. And so we have to ponder, what do we do with this? We are not uh, the Jews of a newly refounded Israel, recommitting ourselves as children of Israel. We are the followers of Jesus who do not worship at a temple. We worship at church. And so what is the parallel to this? How do we understand this to guide our lives today? If the pattern, what happened then was that the Torah, which is the five books of Moses, right? The first five books of the Old Testament. If the Torah laid out what the people were supposed to have done, what they were called to have done, and then the G Jewish people fall into idolatry and, and then coming back to the Passover, coming back to worship is, at the temple is how they recommit, recommit themselves to living as God's people and bringing those who have strayed back home, right? If that's the, 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 what has just happened in very broad strokes, right? Torah had laid out, here's what you should do. They didn't do it. And here's how they move forward from there, right? The, the parallel in the New Testament would be that the gospels lay out what we're called to do as followers of Jesus. And then there's what, what happens. And it's the letters of Paul that lay out how we respond when we, we don't live up to what Jesus calls us to do. And so Torah, uh, when Torah isn't followed, it leads to prophets calling people back. And, and in the New Testament, it's when the gospels will call us what to do. And, and then Paul is the one who calls people back to recommit themselves. Okay, so if that's the parallel, Torah told them what to do, they fell short, and here is how they celebrated Passover as a way to get back to living how they were supposed to go, and Gospels lay out what, there's, what we're supposed to do, and then the letters of Paul kick us back towards how, when we fall short, how, what to do in, in response to when we fall short. What is it that Paul writes about most often? Right? What happens most often in, in the Jewish history of the Old Testament, what happens most often is that people fall into idolatry. Right? That's the thing that comes up most often. What is it that Paul has to deal with most often as he's writing to uh, the churches? Well, what is it that he addresses again and again and again? Well, let's take a look. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes to the church and he asks them, please stop being divided by who you like more as a leader in the church. Please stop bringing your disagreements to court. Don't sue each other. Settle them in-house. And can you please stop arguing about what's appropriate to eat? If you're going to bring food to the potluck, if you're going to bring food to the common meal of all the Christians gathered together, if some of you wants, want to bring meat, that's fine, but if by bringing meat you cause other people a problem, don't. And just get over it. Stop arguing about it. Right? In 2 Corinthians, he writes again to this church. He tells them that they are called as followers of Jesus to take up, up a ministry of reconciliation, to be ambassadors and diplomats on behalf of Jesus. In Galatians, he, he writes to that church and asks them to stop arguing about what the gospel is, that he had already told them the gospel. Stop arguing amongst yourselves about it. In Ephesians, he writes to that church at Ephesus, don't forget that you are one in Christ, who made it so that there is no such thing as a stranger, only people that Jesus loves that you haven't met yet. Bear with each other with humility and gentleness, especially in your family life. Right? Stop bickering amongst yourselves and your families. In Philippians, he writes, Do nothing out of selfish, selfishness, but be of one mind, and that will make my joy complete, which implies that they're not of one mind, and his joy is not complete. And we know that's the case, because then at the end of the book of, of Philippians, he writes to two ladies, Eudodia and Syntyche, and he asks, Can you please work out your differences? And then he calls a third person, Syzygis, and says, Now, Syzygis... Sizigus, can you please help these two folks work it out, remembering that their names are written in the book of life? Right? Do you see the pattern that, that develops here? The thing that Paul writes to the churches more than anything else is about arguing in conflict. 
It's about whether they are committed to making peace and re resolving debates and disputes and disagreements amongst themselves or, or not, right? Paul goes so far as to send a letter with a runa runaway slave, Onesimus, and he writes this letter when Onesimus takes, goes back to his master, Philemon, and, and says to Philemon, the, the master, now your, your slave, Onesimus, is a brother in Christ. Treat him like family. I hope you can work it out and there not be a disagreement about this, right? Paul is pretty blunt. And we could go through the rest of the Pauline letters, but, but I think you see what, what's going on there, what, what's going on in this. The, the challenge in the days of the Old Testament, when it, get, when it got bad, it was bad because the Jewish people fell into idolatry, and then they were called back to faithfulness by the kings and the prophets who did so uh, and by bringing them together and recommitting and celebrating the Passover. Like That's the, that's the trend that we see come to its fulfillness, uh, fulfillment at this point, uh, point in the book of Ezra. In the days of the New Testament church, the parallel thing that's happening is when it got bad, it got bad because Christians fell into division and dispute. And they were called back to unity by Paul, and they were called to do so by practicing forgiveness and reconciliation at the communion table. The detail that really helped me hold this together and helped, start, helped me start seeing that this is where to go was the way that even back in the Old Testament moments, uh, it tells us that when they celebrated the Passover, they were bringing people who had strayed back together, sort of a precursor to what we're seeing with Paul, right? All who are strayed are welcome to come home, come back to the table, and let's eat, All right? This is what Paul is working towards in the churches that he serves. Come back together, be reconciled, let's eat. I, I don't think that I invite us to celebrate Passover then as a, as a response to potential idolatry on our part. I, I don't think that's what we learn from the story of Ezra. I don't think that's how, how, it, what, how Ezra forms how we live. Instead, the way I think the story of Ezra forms our lives is I think it makes sense for us to ponder then our roles as diplomats and as ambassadors, right? Because the challenge then was idolatry. The challenge now seems to be, as Paul lays out, division. Division that happens. And so our, our call is to respond as diplomats and as ambassadors who willingly engage in what divides us so that we can listen and understand and serve. By the grace of God that this that we might be able to bring together and bring back home those who have strayed. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, please bless us who gather this day that we might be able to overcome anything that divides and seek to follow you as a united church. Not as a church that agrees on everything, but that agrees that you are Lord, and that your will and your desires are what is most essential. And when we fail, as will happen, when we fail, as the Jewish people did multiple times, and as the first churches did, help us to hear the words of Paul and those who follow in his footsteps today, challenging though this might be. Amen. Now may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you this day and always. Go forth now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.